Please welcome Sean Thompson. <laughs> So now you see the connection between the real waves and our riding the wave. So Sean is a leadership mentor and lectures widely on the code method, a high impact program that activates the power of purpose to improve well-being, engagement and performance. As an entrepreneur, he founded two market leading international clothing brands, Instinct in the 80s and the Solitude which he co-founded with his wife, Carla, in the 90s. He's a former world surfing champion, has been described as one of the 10 greatest surfers of all time, and one of the most influential surfers on the, in the, of the century. During his professional career, he won 19 major pro events, and is recognized as one of the world's most innovative tube riders. Sean is author of The Surfer's Code, and the recent number one Amazon bestsellers, The Code, The Power of I Will. He produced and co-wrote the award-winning documentary film, Busting Down the Door, a dramatic story of how a group of young Australians and South Africans created professional surfing and built a multi-billion dollar industry. He's a business finance grad from the University of NATO holds a Master's of Science in Leadership from Northwestern University, Northeastern University and is an inductee in the US Jewish and South African Sports Hall of Fame. Sean has lectured across the world and inspired corporations like General Motors, Cisco, Pricewaterhouse, Google, Disney and The Gap and then many more. He's a former board member for Surfrider Foundation and Santa Barbara Boys and Girls Club of an ambassador for boys to men mentoring. He lives in Santa Barbara, California with his wife Carla and 20, 20 year old son Luke. His simple mission is to help individuals activate their own personal code to create a better and more purposeful life. Please join me in welcoming Sean Thompson. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Karen, and thank you uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, I just flew in from, uh, from San Diego uh, yesterday, and it's wonderful to be here. I just connected with uh, Karen about uh, a few weeks ago, and he asked me to come up and, and, and speak, to, uh, speak to all of you, to speak to the team. As a former professional surfer, you can connect with people in a completely different sport and field and, and make an impact. So over the last 20 years, I've been um, going around to all sorts of different com com companies and in my own way, trying to make an impact on purpose, on helping people ignite and activate uh, purpose. And what I've come to realize over the 20 months of COVID, uh, I've spoken to about 200,000 people in some of the fastest growing companies um, in the world, I've come to realize that our words have great power to disconnect and connect us. Our words have unbelievable power for disruption and transformation. Just the simple words that we use on a daily basis. Words have great power for despair and words have great power to uplift. Words have great power for hope. So what I want to do right now is I want to get a single word from all of you that describes how you're feeling right now. Just one word. And what you can do <clears throat> is you're just going to text the word and we're going to build a word cloud. So you've got to go to the, you text the message, Sean Thompson 929, to that number, double two, triple three. Okay, so you're going to text the message, Sean Thompson 929, to double two, triple three. And then we're going to build a word cloud. And then we're going to do a couple of polls a little bit later in the uh, talk. So just send a word from the top of your consciousness. So no one knows who the word is coming from. So it's absolutely anonymous. It's got to be honest. Like, what's the first word that you're thinking of uh, right now? So just to confirm, you're going to text the message, Sean Thompson 929, to the number 2233. Usually the tech works, but uh, 
Let's see if we get a word popping up. So I've done this with about 200,000 people, and the results have been really interesting. Powerful. That's a really good first word. Excited. Keep the words coming. You guys, are, the tech is working. Excited. Another uh, more than one person. Happy. Keep, keep these words coming. Hope. Beautiful, beautiful word. Grateful. Another profound word of, of humility and thanks. Blessed. Bless, cheerful, <clears throat> keep these words coming. Because what this little process does, it just gives us a, a little view of how we are feeling in this little uh, microcosm. Excited, keep the words coming. Elated, keep, keep, keep the words bombing through. Just one word each. Great, adventurous, pleased, but excited and blessed. So. I've got to tell you that this team is in marked contrast to many of the other teams that I've worked with over the last two years. So I call it a sad mindset. These have been the four principal words. So this leadership team certainly has a different mindset to how the rest of the world has been. These have been the four words, stress, anxiety, depression, and disconnection. This is what the world has been fighting with over the last 20 months, and now it seems like we are certainly moving forward. So these words, the way we think, have incredible power, power to connect and power to change our mindset. We're the only people on this planet that can change our mindset, and the easiest way to do it is with our words. So where do we get this like fundamental power? Where do we get our mojo from? We get our mojo from our purpose. So I'm going to show you a little method today. Find your purpose, find your power, find your path. It is such a simple transformational purpose, a method that millions of people have used it to just go from here to there. It's super simple and it's super fun. So the word that I want everyone to remember when I walk away today and you, know, you get involved in your other conferences is that word power and that words have unbelievable power for positive change. I'm going to give you a little perspective on power and purpose, and then I'm going to talk to you about the code method. So when I, when I was chatting with, with Karen, you know, we spoke a lot about values, about how values are fundamental to our character, values are fundamental to our lives, and values are fundamental to our business success. So this code method that I'm going to talk to you today about, what is a code? A code is a list of values, and values are the power behind purposeful action. So our values are essentially our life power, our mojo. That is what gives us the juice. So when one wants to look at like a straight definition of purpose, purpose is power that enables organizations and individuals to thrive. I like to think that there's five simple elements to purpose. I've developed this little acronym. Purpose is aspirational. Our purpose is like our North Star. That's something that we aspire. It's not like I'm going to hit my third quarter goal. It's, it's an aspirational goal. Purpose is inspirational. Our purpose not only inspires us, but it inspires our friends, our families, our peers, our colleagues. Purpose is essentially moral. It's honest, it's moral. And purpose is authentic. My purpose is authentic to me. Your purpose is authentic to you. And purpose is timeless. It's not like a smart goal, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time sensitive. Purpose is forever. Purpose is timeless. So why is purpose important? These are some, I, I'm not going to show you many stats today, but I wanted to show you this one. So this was a long term, this was a longitudinal study of 73,000 people. Having purpose in life makes you live longer. In fact, it makes you live twice as long. So this is fundamental to our life mission is that you want to live longer, you better have a sense of purpose. Purpose makes you feel physically and mentally active. Working with a sense of purpose, you know, you're the leadership team, leads to greater engagement, motivation, productivity, and retention. And then this is a study from EY. Purpose-led organizations perform 42% better than those that are simply in business. So having a sense of purpose impacts bottom and top line. So the code method is a simple way to find and define your purpose. <coughs> so 
What I, uh, I was chatting to Karen as well is, I'm going to give you a perspective today. I'm going to give you the code and a perspective, and I'm not giving you in any way, shape, or form a prescription. I'm not telling you which road to travel on. I just want to give you a simple perspective of my life that's been lived with power, passion, um, and purpose, particularly passion. You can see I'm a pretty, surfing they call it stoked, man. This is like a feeling of like exhilaration. You can see I'm a, a pretty passionate guy. I wrote these five words. Just do a good turn today. I mean, super simple, very, very uh, um, basic. The fundamental maneuver in surfing, they call it a bottom turn, so it relates back to, to a, a surfing maneuver. And this became the poster for this new organization called Surfrider Foundation, which today is about a $20 million organization with millions of, <coughs> excuse me, millions of activist supporters around the world. But for me, it was my first sort of venture into a community and environmental based organization. And it really, in many ways, was a new turning point. It was a new path for me to follow. So after I retired from the tour, I sold uh, my company, Instinct, and my wife and I moved over to the United States the same time you moved over in 1995. We moved to, to uh, America. Now, after I retired, I'd come to the United States and I'd come over looking for a job. And I'd gone around to all the surfing industry and, you know, saying, you know, I'd, I'd love to get a job. I'd sold Instinct. I'd, I, I wanted to just kind of ease into America before I started another um, company. And no one wanted to hire me. I couldn't get hired by any of these famous surfing, surfing brands. And then on my last day there, a friend of mine said, Sean, there's a small company in Ventura that you should go and check out. It's called Patagonia. Have any of you guys heard of Patagonia? <laughs> so Patagonia is like, if you look at a list of the most admired companies in the world today, they're either number one or they're number two. Back then, no one had heard of Patagonia. So I go down to meet the crew at Patagonia, and as I walk in, there's a school right there at the HQ. And I go, what's the school here? They say, no, it's our school. It's our school for our team, for our team members, for the kids go to the school. And we go, well, how cool is this? I met Milan, Yvonne and Melinda Chenard and just fell in love with the ethos of this company and what they wanted to do to create environmental sensibility and community upliftment. So I worked for them for two years. I ran the, uh, uh, one of the apparel divisions. And Yvonne would have these, he called them philosophy sessions. So they'd be like me and a couple of, three or four other people. And we'd sit, he didn't even have an office. So Yvonne Chenard used to tell me, Sean, I subscribe to the MBA theory of management. I said, the MBA theory, what is that? He said, it's called management by absence. <laughs> he was always out in the field somewhere, climbing a mountain, management, management uh, by absence. Um, so when I was reading through some information about, about Jade, I came, across, um, I came across the CEO theory. Do you guys know the CEO theory? Because it's... It's on your website. So the CEO theory, <coughs> collaboration, education, opportunity. So I went, wow, this is, you know, these words, simple words, collaboration, education, opportunity, management by absence. And then he used to tell me his business theory. He used to say, Sean, you've got to understand, business is simple. Doing good is good for business. Think about that. Doing good is good for business. Whenever I've had a tough decision to make, a tough financial decision to make, and I've made it for the right reasons, it's been the right decision for the business. So profitability comes, it's not the sacred triangle, profit, sales, and growth, but profitability comes essentially from purpose, and purpose comes from the V word, values. So there's a real simple equation there. So worked for them for a few years. I had a great experience. And then my wife and I decided to go out on our own and we started a new company and we called it Solitude. Instinct was about riding inside the tube. Solitude was about escape, just escaping from, um, from the pressures of, uh, of modern life. <coughs> and our company prospered and we located our company right across the road from the beach. And we also based on what I'd learned at Patagonia, we really had a strong environmental focus. We were the first surfing brand to really look at sustainability and how to create sustainable uh, products. But I located it right across the road because I was still a stoked surfer, even though I had retired 
from one of the most famous beaches in California called Rincon. When the surf's good at Rincon, you can ride about a mile. It's an incredible, incredible wave. I mean, imagine doing this in connection with um, your foundation, India. It would be amazing. These kids, they just, all kids want is something small and simple that they can use to find power. It would be so easy. And I like to say this code, it's open source code. <laughs> anyone, anyone can use it. <laughs> and I know you guys know a lot about code. <laughs> So I went across the country. This is the first school started by a black African in South Africa where Nelson Mandela voted for democracy in 1994. The headmaster, Justice Michelle, he said, Sean, I want you to come to my school every month. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I live in the United States. This was one of the greatest moments of my life. I'm standing there with Ernest Mungani in Corsi. He's a headmaster of that school with 1,600 students. I met Ernest when he was 10 years old. His mom worked for my mom. He was working in the garden to make some extra money <coughs> for school. <coughs> and he's just a great kid. And he said, oh, Sean, you know, my mom's got no money and I need to go to school. I said, I'll help pay your way through school. I was a pro surfer making good money. And then he graduated, did really well. He said, Sean, I want to go to university. And there weren't many black kids going to university in the days of apartheid. I said, sure, I'll help pay your way through university. And he did well at university. And then my wife and I moved to the United States and I lost touch with Ernest. And when I went back from the tour, I get a phone call. Hey, Sean, it's Ernest Bongani and Corsi. Do you remember me? He said, of course I remember you. He said, I want to tell you about my life. I'm a headmaster. I have 1,600 students. I have two university degrees. I have two teaching credentials and you are coming to speak at my school. <laughs> and I went and spoke at the school. This is one of the classes. And he stood up before me and spoke. You know, like I told you, I've spoken with the biggest speakers in the world. Ernest Bongani and Corsi, it was like seeing a young Nelson Mandela or uh, a young JFK. He just stood up there with such presence and he was so articulate and eloquent. And to know that I played such a tiny part in his life, it made me feel like the greatest human being on earth. It was like better than winning the world title. So it was just a wonderful feeling. And I went across the country speaking at these huge schools. So Elon Musk, this is his alma mater. This is where Elon Musk went to school, Pretoria Boys High. All the students wrote their codes. And this class, you can see what the kids write. I will change the world. I will be a conqueror. So if you want to know where Elon Musk got some of his mojo from, this school here, Pretoria Boys High. <laughs> the mojo is still living in this school. And uh, this was my, one of my last schools. Now I work with all sorts of groups. For every time I do an event for an organization, I do a pro bono event for, for a group. This is a Santa Barbara County Jail, a group of 900 prisoners. I will always do the next right thing. I will never go back there. They, they write their words and they find a path forward they find hope. I work with athletes. This is an athlete that couldn't get out of 25th place, stuck at 25th place on the World Professional Surfing Tour. I got him to write his code. Hey, Zeke, write 12 lines, every line beginning with our will. And this exercise is called writing your code and is the ultimate map for your life tomorrow. It's the way for warrior. He got a third in the very next event and a month later won one of the biggest contests in the world. Um, in Hawaii. So this little code process, while it sounds incredibly juvenile, it is juvenile because sometimes life becomes complicated and we lose touch with the naivete and hope that's at the essence of our existence. And this is a simple concept, 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. It's just a way to idealize and commit and recommit to your value structure. This is a rugby team in South Africa, last place in the league. We worked with them on the code. They won the equivalent of the South African Super Bowl. It's called the Curry Cup. And I'm not saying that this method made them win. But as all of you have followed cricket intensely, this I know, there's a millimeter. One millimeter is the difference between success and failure. And sometimes all you need is a little bit of extra juice to go from being a loser 
to being a, a winner. Now I work with organizations across the world. You've seen these big names, Google, GM, PwC, Cisco, Disney, Gilead Sciences, Databricks, Single Store. Or, I mean, I work with companies all the time and I get everyone to write the code because it's a way for all of us to connect with our values and not be the best, but just be better. That's my goal, that's my mission. Not be the best, just be better. It's not my words, it's your words. And all of you, in a little bit, are gonna do this little experiment together. So this is what a lot of companies do. One line from each team member, and they'll put this up in the HQ after everyone has written their code. I will stay hungry and curious always. I'll be the best version of myself. So the words of the team are like the culture of the organization come to life as a series of commitments that are immortalized on the walls at the HQ. This is from Single Store. I got this yesterday, or day before yesterday. I will keep on going. I will spend more time in the sea. I will devote time to animals. I will fight through challenges. Just wonderful words that are there. Not every day you don't go and read it, but every, day, every now and then you maybe might walk past it and go, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. I will prioritize fun. So the code has all sorts of a, a very, very positive, uh, we've done a couple of university studies and it's had some uh, very positive um, vibes around it. So I'm going to tell you a couple stories and then we're going to do this little code experiment. Generally it's 15 minutes, but we're just going to do it for about uh, 10 minutes and we're going to use some cool tech. But I want to tell you two stories uh, and then we're going to do the code writing process. So the first story is about resilience, which as you all know, is one of the key tenets of business success because all of us are going to be kicked to the ground at one time or another and we're going to have to rise back up. So this is about a life and death incident. And this is based around the chapter in, in the book called um, I Will Always Paddle Back Out. So in surfing, like the Mount Everest of surfing in my era was a place called Waimea Bay in Hawaii. This is a place where the biggest waves in the world broke. Waves of between 25 and 30 feet. It was just the as, as big as one could ride. Today, guys are riding bigger waves. They pulled into jet skis uh, behind these little jet skis, but then it was just arm power. And there was no one there to rescue you. If you had a bad wipeout, you were on your own. So I made it to the finals of the biggest contest uh, in the world. I was the only guy that had not ridden this break before. Um, They'd had it at another venue, the surf got very big and they moved it because the surf got, they call it in, in Hawaii, closing out. And only Waimea can, can uh, handle these big waves. So I made it through to the finals and I paddled out in this enormous surf, about 30 feet, with Australian and Hawaiian legends. And as I'm paddling out into these huge waves, they are breaking and they're breaking in slow motion, it looks like. They're so big, they're breaking in slow motion. And when they hit, they land so hard on the water that they actually create this like concussion. If you're standing on the beach watching them, you can actually feel the impact of these waves. It's terrifying. And when you paddle out, it's like your guts have turned to jelly. It's, you are like, you are intense, intense, almost immobilizing fear. And you, your arms feel like stone when you're paddling out. You're so terrified. So I paddle out into the final with these legends, and I'm waiting for the first wave in the final, and I think, I've got to get the first wave of the final. And they're sitting in a group, and I'm the rookie, never surfed there before. So I jump the line, and I take off on my first wave here at Waimea Bay. And as I leap to my feet, I think in my mind, I got this. You know, I'm confident, I'm young, I'm 19 years old, I'm strong, I'm going, I got this. And as I stand to my feet, I have this sort of hubris, arrogance. I got it, man, I got it under control. And all of you know from business, when you think you got it under control, <laughs> you are about to be smacked on the bum. And then a millisecond later, the wave hits this shallow coral reef, stands vertically, and my board flies through space. And I start spinning through space thinking, wow, this is going to be bad. Because it, it like happens in slow motion. And this is what happens to me. I fall through space, I land, and then I skip across the surface like you skip across, skip a stone. Boom, boom, boom. And a person told me, when you get hit by a wave at, like, at Waimea Bay, it's like being run over by a truck. Well, I tell you what, this wave hits me so hard, it's like being run over by three trucks and knocks every single iota of air out of my lungs, kaboom, and then forces me down about 20 feet 
to the coral below and jams me on the coral. Boom! So now I'm on the coral and I'm being ripped around in this like vortex and like this watery tornado. And I know in my mind, I've got 17 seconds to get back up to the surface. Because big waves come in a set of waves. There's a whole collection of waves, usually five or six. They're about 17 seconds apart. If I don't get up in 17, the next wave will come out over me and I've run out of gas, all the air's been knocked out of me by this big wave, and I'll drown. So I've got to get up in 17 seconds. So I'm on the coral trying to get my footing, and I start swimming for the surface. And I know these waves are all stacked up, because the, I've made the biggest blunder riding big waves, never take off on the first wave of the set. But I had to get that wave to like stamp my authority on the final. And I'm swimming to the surface, just praying I can get that gulp that's going to save my life. And I burst through, and I get the one gulp that saves my life, and then the next waves impact on me. Bang, bang, and smash the hell out of me. And my board's washed in, and I doggy paddle into my board. It's lying in the riptide, and I jump up on my board, and I feel like I bust my back, my legs are numb, and I'm terrified, I'm shaking with fear. And I get on my board, and I'm 50 yards away from the beach, and about 300 yards away from where I've been. And I have to make the fundamental decision. What do I do? Do I paddle in or do I paddle back out? And this is a fundamental decision for all of us in life because every single one of you here is going to be, is going to experience exactly the same thing in a different context, but you're going to come to that defining moment in your life. What are you going to do? You're going to paddle in when your ass has been kicked, we're going to paddle back out. And those simple decisions like that are really what define our life trajectory and our life path. That's what I've found. And I lay there on my board thinking, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? 50 yards away, worst wipe out of my life, terrified, or am I going to paddle back out? And I made that split second decision and I shifted my board around and I started paddling back out, one arm over the other. And with each physical movement, I started to get stronger and stronger. And over the years, I've, I've thought back to this moment many times and I found out that confronting fear and confronting that visceral fear. All it takes is a bit of physicality and action towards that fear, one arm over the other. And with each stroke, I felt stronger and stronger, and I got back out the back, and a huge wave came towards me, and I took it, and I got an incredible ride, and I paddled back out, and I was fired up and confident, and I got another incredible ride, and I paddled back out again, and I got another incredible ride. And then the final was over, and I paddled in with the legends from Australia, and and Hawaii, and we stood up on the podium, and there was ABC and NBC and CBS and thousands of people, and they started announcing the results. And in sixth place, Shaw Thompson, and I ran up there. I ran up there like Rocky, like I'd won the greatest victory of my life, sixth place out of six, and I had. It was the greatest victory of my life. I went on to win 19 major pro events and won the world title, and, but that was the greatest victory because I proved to myself that no matter what, no matter what, I would be able to paddle back out again. Because only by paddling back out again can you get the next wave. And you heard on the video that I lost my beautiful son, 15 years old. And I lost my beautiful son to a bad choice. At school, they all wore school, school ties. We played a dangerous game called the choking game with your school tie. And I lost my beautiful son. But I found, I found hope. I knew that at my core, that ultimately the sun would rise again, that there would be another wave for me again, no matter what, no matter what, at my core, my essential value. And I think for all of us is that we know that we will paddle back out again to get the, uh, to get the next wave. So I'm hoping that today I've shared my spirit with you. I've spoken about commitment, spoken about connectivity, spoken about resilience, spoken about values, and I've spoken about the code. <clears throat> so now there's a call to action. You've heard my stories, but the winds are going to come, they're going to blow my words away. I'm hoping you remember the word power. I'm hoping you remember the code. But now everyone's going to write the code. Twelve lines. Every line begins with our will. So we only have 10 minutes. Usually it's a 15-minute exercise, but in 10 minutes you can maybe not finish it, but still, we're going to attempt to put as many of the 12 in there. So, it's a simple process. 12 lines, every line beginning with, I will. 
we've allocated 10 minutes to it, so this is what we're going to do. You can go here, just take a photo of the QR code, and it's going to take you to a little place, a little website, where you can write your code. Now, the code is an exercise in vulnerability, so just be honest, but it's an exercise as well in introspection and commitment. And you can produce your own code with your own photo. If you haven't got a photo, just catch a selfie of yourself. I will always give positive critique. I will encourage team in difficult times. I will learn the new and share. I will not be judgmental about others. I will demonstrate through my behavior. I love that concept of being a positive role model. I will inspire others by my achievements. And I will love all. And I'd like to, I'd like to end, end with that amazing statement. And I will give back. I mean, I will give back. So, so what I want to do is I want to uh, just thank you all for listening to me for 90 minutes. And Karen, thank you for bringing me into this wonderful leadership group, this family that, uh, that you guys have here that is founded on values. So, so what's next? I'm hoping that you keep your code. You spent 90 minutes of your valuable time with me writing your code. I still got my code in my wallet that I wrote two decades ago. And when things go sideways, I look at my code and my words give me great power. Share it with your family. Share it with your friends, with your peers, your associates. Like I say, it's open source code. And then also, on that little slot there, there's a place where you can write a gratitude letter if you want to, just a letter to yourself about what you're grateful for. So I'd love to hear from anyone with comments. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I love being on LinkedIn. Karen and I connected on LinkedIn. It's the most amazing platform and medium. If anyone wants to directly email me, you can. Thank you for uh, having me. I hope you enjoy the book. And Karen, thanks for bringing me in. <laughs>